Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Expert Classroom. It's great for you guys to join us today. And we are very excited because we have got an expert farmer with us today. Hi, Anna Kelly, how are you? Hello, hi, Katie. <laughs> it's I'm been a great. while since you've joined us. Thank you so much for coming back. No worries. It's a bit cold, so I'm sitting in my car. I hope that's okay. Oh, absolutely. As long as you can see us and hear us okay, that's absolutely fine. Awesome. Now, we have got a couple of schools joined us already. Hello to St. Paul's at Mossvale. I hope you guys are doing well. And I've also got year four on the line. Year four, I don't know where you're from, but do put it in the chat box. I'd love to get to know you a bit more. Now, before we move on, this session is about biodiversity and sustainable farming. So we've got lots to get through today. Oh, and a big hello to Kayla and Ava Mystery who are joining us today. Hello, you guys. All right, so let's get into it, Anna Kelly. So yes. what does biodiversity mean to you exactly? Uh, well, to me, I suppose it's having as many natural sort of environments on my farm that I can. So I like to have some areas that get uh, retain a bit of moisture and create a bit of a wetland. And then I like to have dry passes. I suppose it's um, not interfering with the natural landscape too much so all the native animals and grasses and trees um, can thrive and breed and grow absolutely now biodiversity literally means lots of different living things and you've got lots of different living things on your farm don't I you do, I do. what kind yeah. of things have you got on your farm well actually I have lots of different um trees which are my favorite so the big woody trees that you might see around red gums and then box trees and then wattles or um all sorts of aw awesome interesting things but they're really important because they host a whole lot of other life around them so they've obviously got birds and they've got insects they've got lizards they have frogs at the base and um, all through the root system they've got other bugs and things growing and those trees actually support so much life but they also provide something that's really important for my sheep and my cows which is shade so really you can't lose having some big trees around absolutely very important for your animals to have shade to take care of them in the yeah. very hot weather and in the cold weather as well I imagine exactly fantastic now sustainability and biodiversity is very important not just in Australia but across the entire world there's an organization called the United Nations that have lots of different goals for all of our planet and one of those goals is number 15 life on land which is all about biodiversity. Now, Anna, you kind of touched on why it's important for your um, your property to be so diverse as well. Yeah. And um, yeah. one of those reasons is that the, it keeps the, the soil healthy as well. And is that Absolutely. important for you? Yeah, really important. Um, no, other than keeping all the native animals happy, but also if the soil's healthy, it means I have to use less chemicals. And also my sheep, really love a variety of grasses and if the soil's healthy it grows all sorts of different pastures and things to keep my sheep happy so yeah as you can see there there's a few oats which um are helping the sheep and there's rye grass and there'll be clovers in there all sorts of different things growing beautiful now yeah. you chose dorper sheep specifically as part of your sustainable farming plan why was that well, they're from a very similar climate to, as what I've got. So they're actually from Africa and they were developed to grow muscle. Um, they don't really grow wool. I did notice a question from one of the students before, and this might answer. Um, Dorper sheep actually grow more of a hair and they shed it like we do. It falls out and they put all of their energy into having babies or lambs and growing meat, which um, is a good way to do good way to do it I suppose yeah <laughs> that's right so you don't shear your sheep do you no look occasionally if they're looking a little untidy because they haven't <laughs> shed properly I might shear them a little bit um they tend to rub their fleece off on trees and fences um yeah it's pretty clever okay so following on from that let's touch on the next question if their hair or their fur sorry their their wool does kind of fall out a lot how do they keep warm is that a worry for you 
actually very hot where, well, apart from today, it's very hot where I live. Um, so they tend to stay in the shade. They don't do much in the heat of the day. We can get up to 45 degrees um, during the day and that can last for a week. You know, there might be a few breezes and whatnot, um, but they sort of do sleep during the day, during the heat of the day, they'll find some shade and they'll just won't move around much. So I don't disturb them. I let them do what they've got to do. I make sure they've got shade and feed and water. We might talk about that later. I'm not sure. But um, yes, that's that, that's kind of the way they keep cool. Okay. So as an Australian farmer, was it an important decision for you to choose a um, a breed of sheep that went well with your climate? Yes, I, I really felt it was very necessary for me and a lot of other farmers feel the same way. Um, and if they don't already, they soon will. I felt it was going to be way more important for me to choose a breed of sheep that suited the environment I had instead of trying to change the environment that I had to suit a breed of sheep that wouldn't really do so well. So I needed something that would be able to eat the pasture that I grow, which isn't lush and green like a lot of us might see when we're driving around, especially in high rainfall areas. I don't have a high rainfall. So I needed a sheep that would do well on dry pastures in hot climates and would really convert most of that feed into having babies and growing meat as well. Yeah. Lots to think about then. So would yes. you say that Dorper sheep are quite... Um, there's quite a lot of Dorper sheep farmers within Australia because we yes, do have that are. kind of climate. Yeah. Yeah, there really are, especially in central Australia where it does get really hot and for long periods of time. But of course, we still have a very um, thriving la and large wool industry and um, those sheep need different kind of feeding as well to create that awesome wool that those farmers grow that we all hopefully wear, like I am right now to keep me warm. <laughs> But yes, it's the best way. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Oh, hello to St. John's Grammar that have joined us. Thank you. Now, Ryan from St. John's Grammar. Hi, Ryan. Ryan asks, why did Anna want to be a farmer? Mm, well, I was born um, in New South Wales and my mum and dad had a farm and I grew up riding motorbikes, horses, yabbing, catching fish, um, working for my dad. We used to have a sh um, wool farm back then. So I would help dad with the shearing. I didn't shear, but I was helping him mustering. And um, I just loved it. I love the big open spaces. I love, love working with animals and it's so rewarding. And I love being outside. And also you meet really good people who uh, have the same sort of interests that you do. Yeah. Amazing. Maybe Ryan would want to be a farmer when he's older as well. I think Ryan should definitely be a farmer. <laughs> there you go, Ryan. Go and visit Anna and she'll teach you all about it. I will. Now, Sophie wants to know. Hi, Sophie. Sophie asks, how do the sheep sleep? Hmm. Well, they count each other. Count all the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really. Um, they usually would sleep, I suppose, some of them standing up and some of them lying down. Usually there's one or two sheep that might keep an eye out just to make sure there's no dangers. Um, and they will sleep during the day. Um, usually they might sleep from about 11 until maybe two and then they'll sleep at nighttime. In, in the night they tend to, you don't often see this because it's dark and also you tend to leave them alone. They all sort of get together, especially in the cold weather and they form a big mob and it kind of creates a heat bubble so they keep each other warm. I know it's hard to imagine, but that's what they do. Oh, what a dream. I wish <laughs> I had a little group of sheep to keep me warm. <laughs> I know. <laughs> now, you mentioned there that they might have one sheep that kind of looks out for predators there. So what, how do you um, use sustainable farming techniques to keep predators and pests at bay? Well, the only real problem I have in my area, and I'm very lucky because um, there's a lot, a big wild dog problem in Australia, but the only problem I've really got for my sheep, I suppose, is foxes and they're for the lambs. Um, so I tend to ask the shooters to come in and shoot around lambing time or just before. Um, and that way I keep the numbers down. Um, and luckily I don't need to worry about wild dogs so that's that's a good thing that's great but what about um pests as in uh plants 
um, some uh, farmers weeds in Australia and... actually use. Go on. Uh, so there are some poisonous weeds that grow that sheep can um, get poisoned from and die. I don't yeah. tend to have that many where I live. Um, it's good, just good farming practice, I suppose, and you learn how to control what you've got and then you try and out-compete it. So you try to encourage the good things to grow and the bad things not to grow by using grazing techniques and things like that. It might be a little complicated to go into today, but that's the general idea if anyone wanted to do some more research about that yes we are going to touch on that a bit later on a very okay. very important sustainable farming technique there now some australian farmers use camels to keep weeds in check do you use camels or anything like that <laughs> no i wish i had some camels uh <laughs> no but i know that some people also use goats and they're really handy because they love to eat all those terrible weeds actually so I don't really have a weed problem. And Dorper sheep do okay on weeds as well. You've just got to make sure they're not getting too much of one particular weed. Like it would be like us. If we ate too many Cocoa Pops during the day, I don't think we'd do so well. So we want a varied diet. We want meat and we want vegetables and carbohydrates and all those sorts of things and less Cocoa Pops, I suppose. <laughs> Definitely keep an eye on my cocoa pop consumption yeah, then. I think you should have you. <laughs> now being a farmer of such a large property it must be quite a big job to keep an eye on all of that land yes. so how big is your farm and how do you keep an eye on it all um it's about four thousand acres I tend to go either on my motorbike or on my horse or if I'm feeling like it might be too cold like today I'll jump in the car and go for a drive but yeah I like to keep uh, an eye on exactly what's going on all the time Dorpers aren't very good with fences and they tend to get out they're a bit <laughs> naughty they can be naughty so I need to check that they're all still in the paddock <laughs> very important mustn't lose the sheep yeah. Now, on the right hand side of the screen here, we've got a photo of your farm in one of the very dry seasons. So what kind of practices would you put in place to make sure that you don't run out of water? Um, well, we get water from a big channel, so we make sure the dams are very full and clean. Um, and I make sure I've got enough feed in front of me. And I, if we go through a drought, I might have to buy hay in, which isn't um, a great idea for me because I don't want to introduce weed seed and all sorts of things and it's really hard work feeding sheep so I might reduce my sheep numbers by selling them to the neighbor if he's got more feed or more land or I might buy some more sheep in if I've got lots of green grass to eat so yeah you just have to fluctuate with the seasons. Excellent now Zoe's asked how many sheep do you have? Um, about 520 at the moment. Oh my goodness that is a big family. <laughs> all right so um when we talk about being sustainable that's quite a large topic um so let's kind of think about what some of the things that you actually use so can you give us an overview of whether meat production as a lamb farmer is a sustainable industry and why um of course it is um it's i suppose when it's done properly and a lot of Australian farmers are doing a really good job of running sustainable farms um, and more and more are doing it so changing some of those old techniques and adapting better to their environment and their weather um, I suppose it's just be about being up to date with all of the information that's out there which is huge obviously and making sure that you're not overgrazing um, you're making sure that your sheep are happy and also, what else? I can't think at the moment. Um, Is there any special technology that you might use to, to help you be a bit more sustainable? Um, no, not particularly. Electric fences, maybe if I had to um, to control some grazing. Mm -hmm. um, no, not, not really in regards to sustainability. It's just, I suppose, growing as many animals as your land can support and having less inputs with chemicals and pesticides and herbicides that's what I that's the sort of practice I follow I don't overstock absolutely and it's important that you don't overgraze the land as well because that could um issue absolutely. a bit of a problem going yes. and then you get weeds growing like we spoke about a few minutes ago if you overgraze so no I try to keep my sheep numbers quite low and I sell my sheep mainly into farmer's markets. So I really only 
process the number of sheep that I need and grow the number of sheep that I really need for my market. Yeah. Excellent. Now, Oscar's asked, hello, Oscar. He asked, how do you bring the sheep all together in the yards? Uh, I use my horse or my motorbike. And I muster them and I love doing that because it gives you a chance to see everybody, make sure everyone's happy. I've got a few favourite sheep who I recognise and it can be hard because they do look quite similar to each other. Um, so I usually use the motorbike actually, unless I'm feeling like I've got a bit of time and I jump on the horse. The horse is fun because the horse goes quite slowly and it walks at the same pace as the sheep. So that's good. <laughs> That is good. Yeah. Now on the screen here, we've got a nifty piece of technology that lots of Aussie farmers use. Yeah. Um, so how do you kind of use this technology to, um, to help with your water management? This is such a basic thing, but it's so clever and basic. So it's a water trough and um, it's under pressure. It's not powered by electricity. So you can see the ball there floating on top of the water. When the water level drops down, the ball drops down because it's floating and then it opens up a valve further behind and the water flows in. So somewhere way back along the water line is a tank and it's full of water and it's creating pressure. So that's how we do it. It's just, Occasionally I'll have to clean those out and I make sure that if there, a bird or a frog gets in there that he can get out because um, birds use that to drink as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They, Fantastic. So that's also a really good way to support the native animals as well. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Now, for everyone joining us, I've just noticed that you guys are putting some questions in the Q&A box, but I can't see it on my screen. So if you could put all of your questions in the chat box, then I'll be able to see what you're asking. Thank you. Now, we did touch on rotational grazing. So on the screen is a little, little animation that I found from the Great. Meat and Livestock Australia channel that shows how farmers might do rotational grazing. Now, it is a bit of a complex uh, concept, Anna. So do you wanna give us a brief overview of what it is and how farmers would use it? Okay, very briefly and quickly, uh, I tend to put all my animals in one paddock and wait till they've eaten down to a certain level. And then I move them all into the next paddock and shut the gate behind them. So all of that original grass can grow up and you must be aware of when the seed is being set in the grass. So you don't want to eat all the sheep to eat all the seed because you want new grasses to grow next year. So you need to be aware of what grass species you have, what your rainfall is and when the rain's going to come. And also how much sheep feed a sheep will need and all your mob of sheep. So that's how you do it. Yep. Fantastic. So why is it important to give parts of the land such a good rest? Is it just uh, a it's really good for the soil microbes and everything that lives in the soil so it can do its job and seed to, grass seed to set as well and also if there's any weeds they can get out competed by other good desirable pastures i suppose while that's happening and then if the sheep are moving on to fresh grass it's really good for their development and their milk if they needed a lot of milk because they're lambing so you want to put them on the best pasture that you've got um, I suppose it's just about being aware of what your needs are and how you can satisfy your animals. <laughs> Absolutely, very important. Yeah. So a couple of questions coming in from year four at St. John's. Um, they ask, what crops do you grow on your farm? Do you grow any crops? No, I don't. I used to maybe have some um, oats to grow hay, to make hay. Um, but now it's all about sheep and pasture, native pastures and other remnant pastures that might have been sown years and years ago by some other farmer um yeah but no crops fantastic next one is how much money does it cost to run a farm good question how long is a piece of string <laughs> um, i it's a really hard question but it can be expensive if it's dry and you have to buy all your feed in of course or you have to buy water because a lot of people do buy water in to feed that to water their stock or to grow pastures um animals can be expensive to buy so if you need to buy some new sheep or new cows they can be really expensive depending on the market and what's going on in the world so yes i think that you would probably need to save up quite a bit of money before you bought your farm and all your animals there you go and quick question before we move on what disease kills sheep the most oh really good questions we've got today mm. 
Well, we have an immunisation for lots of sheep diseases that have been detrimental to the sheep population in Australia. We're sort of through research with meat and livestock and vets and all sorts of things, we've managed to eliminate a lot of things. Um, parasites in their tummies aren't that good. They can have a big effect. <sighs> diseases. I can't really think... There's a few pests like flies when fly, sheep get fly struck, which isn't very nice. And also um, weather. I know it's not a disease, but weather can affect mm. sheep numbers. Interesting. So as a, sorry, <laughs> as a farmer, is it important that you kind of stay up to date with um, the most recent research with Meat and Livestock Australia? Definitely. And we can all jump on the Meat and Livestock Australia website at any time or ask all the guys there. And, yep, we can keep up to date with what's going on in Australia and also around the world because growing meat and protein is so important and doing a good job of it is so important. So we need to take it very seriously. Fantastic. Well, speaking of taking it seriously, do you fancy playing a little game with me? Me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now it's a very easy game it's called real or fake and I'm gonna give you a sustainable farming strategy and you're gonna tell me whether it's real or fake okay. mm. all right we'll start with a really really easy one is reducing water runoff a real strategy or a fake strategy it's a real real strategy it is. You're absolutely right. Is that something that you have to worry about on the farm? Well, actually, my land is very, very flat. So water's not really going anywhere. But there's a lot of very hilly country around Australia. And you really want the water to hang around instead of getting into the, you know, the streams and the rivers. So yes, you want to reduce water runoff. And you don't want erosion. That's another thing as well. Absolutely. All right. Next one. Encouraging birds and insects. Mm, real or fake? Real. You're absolutely right. Of course, it's real. What kind of birds do you get around your farm? Um, lots of parrots, which are my favourite. Um, galahs, grass parrots, all that sort of thing. Some corellas. Um, and also we get wedgetail eagles, which are awesome. So they're the biggest bird of prey. Yeah. Beautiful. I know. Amazing. All right, next one. More livestock, less space. Real or fake? I think that's um, fake. Of course yeah. oh. it's fake. Of course it is. You've already said that you have to keep an eye on how much stock that you do have. So we don't overgraze. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Now, while we're on that, Primrose has asked, how old are the sheep? They vary from one day old all the way through to maybe about 10 or 10 and a half years old. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Very nice. All right. Next one we've got here. Don't plant anything new. Is that real or is that a fake strategy? I think that's a fake strategy. Of yes, course, it's a fake one. That's absolutely right. Lots of Australian farmers are busy planting lots of native trees and bushes around their farm. Is they that are. something that you do to encourage biodiversity? Absolutely. Because years and years ago, when none of us were around, lots of farmers would clear the land thinking, that would be better for growing pasture. But actually, you want the trees for shade and for hosting all that li bird life and animal life that we spoke about earlier um, to keep everybody happy. May as well keep everybody happy. There's not much else to do. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Now, lots of Aussie farmers have started putting in place something called conservation areas. Yes. What does that mean? Um, I suppose it's exactly what we've been speaking about. Well, oh, they will fence off zones and plant indigenous species so they might plant trees that used to be there way way back or grasses and they will let the native environment take over it's a really good sustainable practice to follow excellent all right last one here looking after the soil is that a real sustainable practice or a fake one that is real of course it's real and you've mentioned that you don't use many chemicals is there any kind of treatments that you use for the soil um, no not really other than resting it in rotational grazing or um if i need to graze it really hard if say if there was a weed there that 
I wanted the sheep to eat before the weed set seed to have that life cycle. I would put the sheep in there and I'd make sure they eat, they would eat it all down. So that's, no, I don't use any chemicals at all, actually. Mm. Oh, very good. Well, I'm pleased to say you scored 100% on the game. Well done. <laughs> so looking after the native animals and the native land is something that, that we can all be part of. So what kind of things can we do at home and at school to be sustainable? Um, are you asking me? I am. Now, I thought uh, we'd draw on some of your experiences in terms of mindful water use. And some of our students joining us might have some ideas. So if you have got some ideas about how to be careful with your water or how you reuse water, just like Anna does with her very smart techie troughs, yes. pop it in the chat box. I'd love to know about it. Good but idea. what about things like recycling and other reusing? Do you do that kind of thing on the farm? Um, well, I do in my house, obviously. Yeah. Um, I no, not real, not really. We make sure that we um hmm. no, we re reuse everything that we can, I suppose, but nothing specifically, no, I can't think of. <laughs> <laughs> Some Australian farmers reuse their livestock poo to fertilize the land as well. Is that is that always been kind of a, a good practice for farmers? Well, yeah, definitely. I just let my sheep poo where they want. I don't pick it up. And my horses and my cows all do the same thing. Um, if I'm growing vegetables, I'll go to the sheep yards and get some of the poo that's been left there to use on my vegetables. Um, but yeah, that's a really good practice. Excellent. Now, Patrick has chimed in in the chat box. He says, don't waste water. You're absolutely right, Patrick. He says, turn the tap off so we don't waste it. Something very right. important. Well yep. done. Now, we've got a question from St. Paul's. They ask, how often do you need to call the vet? um look probably about three times a year because there might be a sheep that's sick and I don't know what's wrong with it and I need to know in case it happens to another sheep or I what else have I done I've had some lambs that have been stuck so I've called the vet but I can usually just talk to the vet over the phone and the vet will tell me what to do um or if my horse is sick so maybe three times not much more than that excellent now, one last thing before we move on, how else can we make sure that we're helping our Aussie farmers? What can we do? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. Just remember to buy lots of delicious red meat from your local butcher or your supermarket. Um, we are all growing that. We're putting a lot of work into growing amazing meat that we have in this country and vegetables and all the rest of it. I suppose that's what it is, yeah. It's just about a good demand for our product that we've put a whole lot of hard work into. Yeah. Very important. And we do appreciate that hard work as well. It's delicious, that meat. <laughs> All right. So our last section here is a quick fire question round. I've got a few questions. And if you guys have got a few questions, pop them in the chat box. We can get them all to Anna before we finish up. So first question, how long have you been a farmer? Really probably my whole life. There you go. Favourite veggie to go with your lamb? Mm. Pumpkin. Very nice. <laughs> What's the best way that we can be sustainable as a country? Mm. Well, I suppose it's about education. The best way we can be sustainable is by knowing what sustainability means and incorporating some practices into our daily routines with sustainability in mind <laughs> very good that that was a very good answer I like that one good. um what type of sheep shed the most hair um shed or grow I would say um a dorpa or a damara sheds the most hair yes but growing the most wool is probably a merino there which is what, we're, what I'm wearing at the moment is a merino oh. Lovely. <laughs> uh, do you ever have to take the sheep anywhere else? No. There you go. Uh, what's your favourite insect? I love praying mantis. I love praying mantis. And I'm qu quite crazy about spiders as well. I mean, I don't want one as a pet, but I certainly okay. appreciate they've got a very important role on my farm. So spiders are my friends. Very nice. How much money does it cost to buy a sheep? 
Uh, at the moment, one U, which is the mother sheep, might cost about one hundred and forty dollars. Very nice. Uh, what's your favourite animal? Oh God, why do you always ask me this question? <laughs> it's either a frog, a horse, a dog. Actually, a dog. Of course, it's a dog. You know that, Katie. Of course, it's a dog. You've got lots to choose from as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Last question then: Who <laughs> should eat Aussie lamb? Everybody. Everybody should eat Aussie lamb. Is there anywhere that we can look out for your lamb? Uh, well, if you live in Victoria, you can go to some farmer's markets and you might see me there. Yes. There you go. Oh, one more question from St. Paul's before we finish. How old are the sheep when you send them to be processed? Um, about a year old, maybe a smidgen older. It depends on what season of the year it is and how uh, big they are. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's all we have time for today, Anna. Thank you so much for joining us. You are a fantastic expert. Thank you very much for having me along. Awesome. Anytime. Thank you so much. And to everybody else, thank you for joining us in the Expert Classroom. Stay up to date with all our experts by following our Expert Classroom YouTube channel and going to our website to check out who our next expert is. And remember, if you want to be an expert, learn your craft, practice and share every day. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.